All right, welcome to episode 13 of Security Matters with the Coffee Squad. How you doing, Jake? Looks like we're down one man today. Yeah, Ray Ray's out, you know, doing Ray Ray stuff, so uh, doing good, man. How you doing? I'm doing okay. Ray out making TikTok videos again. You know Ray, man. That's that's his favorite thing to do. So I'm waiting for a sponsorship for him. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so this week's topic uh, for everyone that's listening is uh, active shooters. And uh, just for those who are joining us and haven't heard us before, um, our outline usually uh, goes, you know, uh, we are the coffee squad, even though some of us, like myself, uh, really don't drink coffee. So we'll start with what we're drinking. The, then we usually try to do an interesting, possibly funny question of the week, followed by uh, some news articles of the week. And then we jump into the topic, which, again, is active shooters this week. So uh, it should be a good, fun podcast. And, uh, yeah, Will, what are you drinking? Well, normally I'd have my cup of Joe and it'd be all foofy. Well, I mean, it's not foofy, but you know, I get all detailed into it, but because of storms and technical difficulty, we're having a recording session in the afternoon as opposed to the morning. So I'm drinking a nice sparkling lime water from La Croix. No, you're not. Croix, La Croix. It, you know, you're drinking some like, oh, I was expecting some like iced coffee latte, mm -hmm. caramel, you know, your, your typical oh. foo-foo-y coffee drink. No, I'm just drinking some water today. I'm okay. trying to rehydrate. What about you? Nice. What are you drinking? So those uh, that were on last week, if they remember Dave's comment about not letting Will on the boat because of his great flavored Kool-Aid beer, uh, I brought a little something on here for Will, you know? So, uh, oh, Dave there you sent, go. Minnie Mouse. Dave sent this over to me. Like, this is what Will brought on the sh uh, on his boat last time. So those of you who are watching, here's a little purple Minnie Mouse great flavor <laughs> treat. So um, I'm struggling today, man. So I'm having a nice, uh, a nice cold Pepsi. So that's made here in North Carolina. Um, yeah. So awesome. All right. So I guess we'll move on to the question of the week. So, Jake, if you could choose any living person to have dinner with, who would it be and why? I think it would be whatever president was in office. So, you know, right now, currently it'd be President Trump if it was, you know, whoever we elect here in the next few months, uh, uh, any president, really. Um, but I'd love to talk with that current president. Just um, I've met a few in the past um, and I think it's awesome. But to have that candid uh, conversation with them of what's going on, you know, how do they analyze the information how do they make the decisions given all that massive amounts of information that they get you know what their life's like um how being a president's affected them i mean heck if you look at you know since i've been an adult looking at the presidents um how they age in those four to eight years that they're in you know um you look at president obama when he was in um a little bit of gray hair to fully gray and just the tired tiredness and the bags on the rise so i just think it'd be cool to to sit down and have a candid conversation like they're frank with me. I'm frank with them. Um, and we kind of go from there. So what about you, Will? Who would you want to sit down and have dinner with? Well, I had a couple of things in mind, but, you know, watching the SpaceX, you know, getting ready to launch and stuff like that. I'd love to talk to one of those astronauts, either one, just to kind of see what their expectations are, what their training were, what they're going through. I, I think that'd be a really interesting conversation to have about their training their experience and, and their expectations the nervousness or whatever they have i think that'd be a good conversation to have that'd be awesome yeah i mean that kind of leads into the the news articles this week right so one of my articles yep. was uh on wednesday you know they're supposed to launch and uh they're held up due to weather but can you imagine like you're sitting on basically this huge exploding bomb and the article that i read was uh, elon musk you know talking to the family members and you know letting them know you know how they've done everything they can uh to ensure their their loved one's safety and then you know kind of going on as you were telling me about talking to those astronauts like can you imagine like getting strapped down and then hearing that timer of like 10 you know the countdown and they sit 10 there down. for like an hour for yeah. all their pre-checks and stuff they're in there for like an hour before the t minus 10 even starts it's just yeah it's crazy how long they sit there yeah i just remember like you know getting on the helicopters you know we're going to do a hit or something you know and you know, the, the pilots are, you know, cutting down, we're listening, you know, through the air systems and, you know, you know, like, all right, Hey, you know, touchdown and, you know, five minutes, you know, and then, then one minute, two minutes out, 30 seconds out, you know, and there's your heart and mm -hmm. that just that pounding that's going on. So 
uh, I would think it'd be that times like a hundred, you know, um, and that adrenaline dump. Yeah. And then just like, what's that feel like, you know, as you're, you're going mock, whatever it is blasting out to space. So, uh, yeah, I think, uh, it's supposed to be on Saturday. So, uh, good luck to the astronauts as, as they get ready to lift off. Um, and, uh, what a proud moment for America. I think it's been almost not quite a decade and uh, yeah, first since time like a, since 2011. Right. So yeah, yeah. it's been Nine a while. Years. So, and the first time that a private company has actually yep. uh, built the the rockets to launch, so uh, pretty pretty great time to be an American. So that was one of my articles. Uh, what about you, Will? What uh, what article did you bring to the table this week? Uh, so one of my articles was talking about how you know London and LA and or New York and most large metropolitan cities have uh, some sort of surveillance program in in place with the cameras and Mexico city just finished their project and they placed three or 13,720 cloud managed cameras deployed in a cyber secure citywide surveillance program using 4g connectivity. So it's a lot of cameras, 13,720, man, that's a lot of cameras. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of wiring. That's a a huge network. I mean, my gosh, like, uh, yeah, I mean, like you said, New York City, L.A., all, all your major, I mean, Vegas. You know, oh, yeah, uh, the casinos alone probably have that many, you know, it's just crazy. But. Yeah. Uh, do they say what the reasoning was, or is it just kind of keeping up with the times, and uh, it is what it is? Uh, it doesn't say, just talking about how they partnered with Eagle Eye Networks, who, which, and it was a like a super fast paced install. Of, they were able to do it in a short amount of the shortest amount of time and get everything up and running. And they are going to have uh, their operational remotely monitor and providing safety and security to assist to their citizens. That's what they put. Huh. So. so I know you're kind of a conspiracy theorist, right? Uh, um, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I just like to question things. So let's, let's, let's hear a little bit. I mean, I, I think, uh, I don't mind them. Right. Um, I think there's a, there's always a line of where you draw of personal privacy. Right. Yep. Um, but if you are doing something wrong, um, and you're going through the cities, I mean, if you look throughout, you know, major areas in the U S you uh, I was just in Huntington Beach a few months ago, and there's cameras, it seemed like, on every single stoplight, you know. Um, what they're used for. Yep. Probably the same thing that they're in New York City for and everything else, you know, whether it's, you know, looking at bad guys or recording, looking at traffic, whatever it may be. But um, I know that facial recognition software and everything else, you know, is detecting part of its body language. So, mm-hmm. um yeah, I guess I understand what, what why thoughts? they do, I understand why they do and I see the application for it, but just like with any other technology or anything really is as long as it's used for what it's meant to be used for, okay, but there's always that chance that somebody's going to take advantage of it or use it for what it shouldn't be used for and that's where I'm, you know, I kind of, you know, I agree. How, you know, I mean, how much do we give? probably the same yeah. way, you know, without going too political on this podcast or anything, but you know, there's a how I much think, of your liberties and your freedoms do you give to make yourself more secure, more, you know, it's, it's just, I'm, 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 it's gonna, I'm in a constant struggle because I see the applications, how good it can be for us. But then I have this little voice in my head, but how much do you want to give to them? You know? Yeah. So. No, I, I agree. You know, there's, that's why I think checks and balances are so, so critically important, um, especially with technology. Right. I mean, we had Scott on what about a month ago, right? So yeah. every, little bit of technology you have um yeah it should free you up in in one area but it's going to bind you down in another area so um craziness what uh what's your second article did you have did you bring another one to the table i i did yes so you know a few weeks ago we were talking about uh, thermal imaging amid the covid19 applications and we talked about a little bit how we foresee airports and employing them and using them as part of their screening process. Well, this article is talking about how TSA is thinking about temperature checks and thermal imaging. You know, they're still trying to work the kinks out. You know, yeah. TSA says that maybe the air, airports or the airline should pay for it. And of course the airlines and airports think, no, TSA should pay for it. They're the ones who are responsible for it. So there's going to be some things that they need to work out, but it's, I think it's going to be coming. I think the they are all going to pay for it. Oh you yeah. Know, I mean, you know, whether they're going to increase for, that, that airline ticket fee with, you know, your airport tax on there or not, uh, the consumer is going to pay for it at the yeah, end. Consumer so it really always doesn't pays matter. for it. So, yeah. uh, you know, and it's just, I, you know, how effective it's going to be is one thing. Just, it, honestly, just like TSA, TSA, how effective are they or how compared to 
is it just making people feel better? You know, because yes, they still catch, they do catch things, and and, and you know, it, it doesn't bother me. Whatever, I set the damn thing off every time I go through. I have so much metal in me, so I'm sure you're the same way. You get uh, the extra, I normally, extra special pat yeah, down. So I normally go to the extra room. So uh, <laughs> um, I it always happens whenever I'm traveling with my wife. So uh, a few years ago, I was a keynote speaker up in DC for a, a nonprofit uh, event. And uh, it was a quick, like 24 hour turn and burn up there. And um, I literally was detained for about an hour and a half, uh, nearly missed my flight by like, I had like 30 seconds to spare um, because uh, for the listeners that don't know, I don't think anyone really knows. I don't think we've ever said it, but I do have a prosthetic leg. Um, and that's why Ray probably takes it easier on me than you. Um, <laughs> but uh yeah, I always, uh, I always get some extra love sometimes. And, you know, 99% of the time, the TSA is really cool and awesome about it every once in a while. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I get a little extra love and, you know, they're just doing their job and I don't mind. But whenever I travel with my wife, I'm always pulled in, get, you know, second, third uh, screening, something's popping hop on their little ion scanner. So uh, I guess the moral of the story for me, don't travel with my wife. <laughs> yeah, so, that's what it is. She's probably trying to set you up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's calm beforehand, so uh but yeah uh cool cool did you bring another article or so i did and uh it's pretty fascinating you know that we're talking about um active shooters this week and um again for the listeners and viewers out there that um uh, are starting to listen to us we usually set these topics up about what at least two weeks in advance we try to sometimes uh, a little bit more yeah, so. two to four weeks depending on the climate uh, yeah so uh on wednesday uh an active duty soldier was traveling to work uh, going to Fort Leonard Wood and on the bridge, uh, he noticed there was an active shooter on the bridge and, uh, you know, uh, guy had been firing off a few rounds. Uh, he injured, uh, one, one civilian. And, uh, again, this wasn't on a federal base. He was driving to work to Fort Leonard Wood. And, uh, as he saw him, he, uh, made that split second decision to pin him down, uh, as the article says in his truck with his vehicle. Um, so, uh, he, he, I, I'm assuming injured the guy. Um, but the big point is that he stopped the shooter from inflicting any more damage. So I think a total of two or three vehicles were shot when one person was, uh, injured, uh, wasn't life threatening. So kudos to that guy, um, for, for making that split second decision, um, and really, you know, potentially saving countless lives. Um, so I think he was armed with a AR 15 and a, and a pistol. So, um, who knows how much ammo he had on him. So, Again, kudos to him. Um, kind of rolls into what we're talking about today. So yeah, you know, it's, it's funny that you're talking about how he pinned him down. You know, got, hit him with his vehicle. When I was a young officer, you know, watching all those videos, I saw one video about a shootout in Montana. They were chasing somebody. They got the bad guy stopped, shot up one of the deputy's cars, disabled it. He hopped in a trooper's vehicle, and they kept chasing him. The guy ended up pulling perpendicular. And the trooper, I believe it was the trooper. I could be wrong. It's been about 10 years since I watched it. But the trooper floored it and actually hit the bad guy as he was shooting out the driver's side vehicle. Oof. And, uh, yeah, you could see the gun go flying and the deputy, like, broke his leg and hip or something like that, you know. So it wasn't they, – they got hurt, but he ended it right there, right? So there's a possibility that they could have – the guy could have escaped if he disabled that vehicle too. So just Yeah, just the harm, out. you know, like the – the i'm trying to think of the the right word to use um but the the cojones you know <laughs> uh, on them you know yeah. both that deputy um and this uh army soldier that that did that you know that to yeah. literally put them their, their life on the line you know to protect others um, um that act of selfless service and um to make that decision that they're going to get between them uh and the potential victims and possibly a victim themselves. So yep. um, craziness, man. Um, so awesome. So um, I think that leads great into our discussion of uh, active shooters. So, you know, as, as we look at what an active shooter is um, and how it presents, you know, a super challenging uh, security and a personal uh, safety issue problems for these organizations today, um, these active shooter incidents, are so unpredictable. They happen so rapidly yep. and so fast and, and evolve quickly. Um, and amidst all that chaos, you have literally seconds to maybe milliseconds to respond. And how we just talked about the deputy and, and this army soldier, how anyone 
can get involved and make a difference. Yeah. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today is how do you prepare for it? Uh, how do you uh, train for it? Um, and then what lessons can you learn? So I think before we do that, we, we should definitely go into a definition and work off a common definition for everyone as we're talking. So, uh, Will, I know uh, you did a little research uh, and you came up with a definition off the FBI website. Do you want to kind of tell everyone and, and read what that definition is so we're all on the same page? Yeah. So according to the FBI, they define an active shooter as one or more individuals actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a populated area. Implicit in this definition is the shooter's use of one or more firearms. The active aspect of the definition inherently implies that both law enforcement personnel and citizens have the potential to affect the outcome of the incident based upon their response to, to the situation. When evaluating these shooting incidents to determine if they met the FBI's active shooter definition, the researchers considered for inclusion a shooting in public, shootings occurring at more than one location, shootings where the shooter's actions were not the result of another criminal act, shootings resulted in a mass killing, shootings indicating apparent spontane spontaneity by the shooter, shootings where the shooter appeared to methodically search for potential victims, and shootings that appeared focused on injury to people, not people, or not places or objects. The uh, this report does not emphasize or encompass all gun-related shootings because the risk to civilians is in active shooter incidents that appear related to the apparent randomness of so many victims. A gun-related incident was excluded if research established it was a result of self-defense, gun violence, drug violence, contained residential or domestic disputes controlled barricade, barricaded or hostage situations, crossfire as a byproduct of another ongoing criminal act, or an action that appeared not to have been put other people in peril, accidental discharge, or a firearm in a bar or a suicide. So that definition, again, it, that was just released through uh, the FBI website, fbi.gov. Um, if you, you can Google active shooters, uh, FBI, and that's off their report. Um, so for and that was released april 2020 um yep. and just to kind of go in some some data right some some statistics off of that report for 2019 there were 28 active shooter incidents um and of those 28 they occurred in 16 states uh in 2019 uh i'll just read off real quick some of those states that they occurred in six were in texas five were in california three were in florida two in illinois one in Washington, one in Colorado, one in Oklahoma, one in Mississippi, one in Kentucky, one in Ohio, one in uh, Pennsylvania, one in New Jersey, one in Washington, or one in Virginia, excuse me, I already said Washington, one in North Carolina, one in South Carolina, and one in Hawaii. Um, so there you, you have a broad spectrum. It, it crosses the entire U.S. And again, we're talking about the United States here for the year 2019. So um, of those 28 active shooter incidents, there are 247 casualties, uh, which do not include the, sh the shooters themselves. Of those casualties, 97 people were killed and 150 were wounded. Of the 97 that were killed, two law enforcement officers were killed and 15 law enforcement officers were wounded. Um, 12 of those active shooter incidents met the criteria for a mass murder or a mass killing. Mm -hmm. um, and a total of the of 30 shooters uh of the total 30 shooters 29 were male and one were female um so again if you look at you know i i get quite a few questions of well, can you come up with a profile what does that typical active shooter look like what's the place look like there isn't a typical profile there isn't a typical demographic that's out there and i'm going to read a few more stats talking about ages of of these shooters and when i read this report I, it was it was kind of mind-blowing um of the the age differences um i think some uh, that i'm going to read here in a second we can all probably shake our head and say yeah um understandable then you just get in the upper ages it's it's mind-boggling so um let's, let's talk about those ages right so five of the shooters were younger than 20 years old uh, 13 were between the ages and tw of 20 and 29. You know, the 5 and 13, those are the numbers I think, you know, we can kind of say, people, okay, yeah, yeah, I can see that, right? Um, four were between the ages of 30 and 39, and I think that kind of falls in that, okay, that, that little bit of that, that area. And then you had five between the ages of 40 and 49, and then two between 50 and 59, and one between 60 and 69. Again, there's such a vast, wide 
range here is what we're talking about. There isn't a specific state. It doesn't matter if your state is, a, you know, a red state or a blue state. You know what political side it, it leads. It, it happens in, in all, you know, all across the country, different states, different uh, agendas, um, oh, the yeah. age group, you know, um, it's not uh, just one white guy that you would typically think in their 20s or, you know, teens, 20s, even in their 30s, uh, all the way up to the 60, 69 age range um, and one female. You know, um, that was surprising to me. So and then if, you know, as we uh, read in this report a little bit more, it broke it down into locations. Right. So um, I think typically um, we think that, you know, we look at active shooters, uh, you know, when I was younger, it's kind of like the uh, the post office. Right. Everyone mm -hmm. used to, you know, make those uh, going postal, going postal remarks yeah. and then Columbine, you know, um, and then some in, in hospitals. Um, but now you look at the majority of the shootings that are taking place, at least in 2019, and you look at the stats for 2018, they're very, very similar, right? So 20, uh, 2019, 12 uh, of the shootings occurred in shopping areas, commerce type areas, malls, Walmart, um, what in Texas, uh, three happened at schools, four were at government facilities, five were just open spaces. So think of your parks, um, two were in houses of worship and two were in healthcare uh, facilities. So Again, you cannot predict and come up with a typical profile or demographic of whom that active shooter is going to be or where that active shooter is uh, going to occur. Uh, and hopefully these stats and the definition that we worked off gives our listeners and our viewers that um, puts in their mind that there's no way to identify this yeah. is where it's going to happen. Um, if so, I don't think we'd see as uh, nearly as many of them. Um, well, that's what's that's what's so you know terrifying i guess you could say that's what really plays on the psychological effect of it is you don't know when or where or who's going to do it most of the time you know looking back i know i think we'll talk about this later but um there are signs of potential workplace violence slash, slash active shooters but you really don't know until after the fact that and, and it, that happens a lot of time in in uh, suicide, you know, more people are aware of it now, but looking back on people who commit suicide, you're like, oh, there were signs, just nobody really picked up on it. And same thing with active shooters. And so the, the, the terror of it is, and that's part of what they want. Well, that's part of what they play off of is, you know, you don't know when, where, or who. So. Yeah, totally. I mean, you, you kind of brought up, you know, that, that psychology of looking back of what could I have done different? You know, I think whenever there's a, a tragic event um just as human beings we want to look back and um i call it the god complex right of what could i have done differently to prevent this um yep um and you know if, if you look at again the stats uh from that fbi report it said nearly three quarters of the shooters had some type of personal connections to the sites they they attack so three quarters uh that's that's uh that's there's fine. something there, you know, there, there's something yeah. that you can look for. Um, and it kind of reminds me, uh, in the past, I've, I've talked to, uh, she was a former FBI profiler. Um, her name is Dr. Sharon Smith. So you can, uh, our listeners can, can Google her and find out more about her. Uh, she's partnered in a company called threat triage. And she had a great quote saying when violence occurs in the workplace and we can tie in active shooters there, uh, those affected often look back and wonder why they didn't see the signs. Mm -hmm. They analyze every communication with the aggressor looking for clues. And very often there were clues uh, there was, uh, that there was risk at that workplace. Um, they just didn't know what to look for. Um, again, go to her website. Um, you can Google her, Dr. Sharon Smith, a former FBI profiler. Uh, she has some great insight there of kind of those signs and those symptoms of, of what to look for. Um, and sometimes it's stuff that we don't even look at. And you brought up suicide. Will. you know, uh, uh, being in the military, a lot of good buddies have committed suicide in the past. And each time that that's happened, I think we're getting much, much better about looking in the past of, you know, uh, when so-and-so, you know, was asking these types of questions, I, it was his way of asking, kind of reaching out, asking for help. Yeah. And we just blew it off, you know? And so when you get those, funny feelings or that gut intuition, uh, whatever you want to call it, you know, sit down, talk to someone, you know, cause they might be feeling the same thing. And if that's the case, mention it, even if someone isn't go ahead and mention it, you know, cause you yeah. just never know what you can prevent. The last thing, uh, I would want for anyone to do is ever second guess themselves and think that they could have prevented something that 
uh, a tragedy from happening. So, uh, well, it's kind of getting here and let's dissect this active shooter of, you know, what are some things that can help um, prevent, you know, um, I know we've talked about, you know, we were talking before the show about some policies and procedures. What, uh, what do you think about that? And for those, again, who are new to the show or, or just joining us recently, you know, Will was a former military and then a former police officer and a SWAT officer. So I think he has some really good insight on, on the subject. So I, preventing it, you know, it's, it's, it's looking for the signs, you know, there's, like you said, though, hindsight's 2020. It's, it's hard to really look back and say, are you to catch the signs? A lot of times, you know, uh, the, the old adage, see something, say something that that's a good rule of thumb to go by. I know a lot of uh, school shootings are prevented that way because of social media, somebody will see something and they'll put it out there. I know we had a scare uh, last year in my, at the high school where my daughter goes and, you know, they're talking about there something was said on social media. Next thing you know, they have it on lockdown and there was a threat. There was a credible threat. Luckily they caught it in time, you know, but so see something, say something's definitely a good rule of thumb. Uh, as far as uh, policies and procedures, you need to have it. You know, a lot of places I don't, as law enforcement, we trained with the schools a lot, you know, cause we were responsible for the schools, So we were always going in there training, you know, during day, we worked days and nights. So during day shift, we'd go in, we'd walk to schools, meet the principals, the teachers, have the layout of the land, all that stuff. So we, we would be familiar with this. So if something did happen, we would know what, what to do and where to do that. But a lot of the business don't invite you in. A lot of the businesses don't train with you. So if you are a business, it's always good to reach out to a law enforcement contact or, or yours, have your security do it and have know what they're going to re, be expecting from you and what you should ex, be expecting from them. I, I think, you know, that's more after the fact or during the fact. But once again, I don't think there's a lot of prevention other than awareness. And that's, yeah. that's the training awareness is the big thing. You know, you have to send your people to your training. You, it should be a, a yearly thing, just like everything else that, you know, sexual harassment and all that stuff. You should have some sort of training awareness in your program. Yeah. And I think we'll jump in a little bit of training here later, but, you know, sticking on the policies, procedures, you, you brought up a great, great point, you know, as a, as a former law enforcement officer, you know, you were responsible for, for the schools and you work hand in hand with those schools. Um, myself, you know, working on the corporate security side with Ray is having these large corporations. You know, we mainly deal with these Fortune 500 type corporations and super high net worth individuals. But having these policies and procedures in place, sitting down at the table and talking um, with the senior executive leadership of what is their policy? Do they even have a policy? And like you said, I know I've interviewed numerous employees uh, at one company and it was on all their minds um, after shooters workplace with violence. And I said, well, what's your, what's your company's policy? And they didn't have one. Yep. Um, and it, it's, I'm not talking about a 50 page policy, but a simple policy, mm -hmm. you know, get something down on paper, have that policy. So people can look at whatever they need to, of, okay, Hey, if X, Y, or Z happens, this is what I'm expected to do. These are our procedures that we need to follow. Um, and it's taking those few steps in advance and mentally rehearsing what you're going to do. That's going to help that employee act so quickly. You know, we talked about uh, your former uh, you know, law enforcement buddy up in Montana, his reaction. You know, we talked about the soldier and his reaction. Um, I don't think either one of them mentally rehearsed for, hey, if there's a shooter, I'm going to do this. Uh, I think it's through their training, though, that they're better prepared than I would say the average person who, let's say, is an accountant or a lawyer going to work because um, it's not on their mind every day. That threat isn't there um, nearly as much as for a soldier or, or a law enforcement officer. But getting your employees to think about, hey, if this does happen, how am I going to react? Because um, seconds and milliseconds count um, and it could either save their life and hopefully many other people's lives uh, there as well. I know I've had a few. Uh, experiences with, with an active shooter in the military. We call them, uh, when we're downrange in a combat zone, we call them green on blues. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a green on blue, it's when uh, uh, we host, we partner up with a host nation and um, we're training with them or going out on target with them. Um, in 2012, 13, 14, uh, and 15, I would even say, uh, in Afghanistan, the Taliban were using the green on blue very effectively. Um, and as I was getting ready to go in 2013, my team and I prepped constantly because this was one of the largest threats in Afghanistan at the time. And so we had, as we were doing these key later engage, engagements, uh, meet with the local 
uh, clergy there in Afghanistan. We constantly train and train for this event. Hey, if something happened, you know, this is how we would react um, and we'd prepare for it. We prepared by having what we'd call guardian angels over us uh, instead of being involved in that meeting, just looking over us. And I know you can't do that in the workplace. Um, however, that was our workplace at the time. So we prepared for it. You know, we had those policies. We had those procedures. And unfortunately for, for myself and my team and a few other teams that were involved with this one incident, uh, an Afghan soldier picked up a machine gun and uh, killed, you know, two of, uh, two of my buddies and uh, wounded five others, you know, and it all happened within a matter of seconds. Luckily, we had been trained. We had trained ourselves and knew that threat, knew the risk that was involved um, and terminated that risk as, as quickly as possible. But even as quickly as possible, it still, you know, you know left two guys dead and five guys uh, wounded for the rest of their lives. And that's the physical part, right? That's now let's talk about that emotional part. You know, what happens, you know, emotionally afterwards? You know, we mentioned earlier about Dr. Sharon Smith and that coworker of looking back and saying, hey, well, I saw these signs. I could have done X, Y, and Z different. That was myself and my team looking back of what we could have done different and questioning ourselves. Um, and it, when you when you have those policies and procedures, I'm not going to say it's going to go away, but it's going to help, I think, on the, the, the negative psychological effect that happens, you know, post, post the trauma happens. So um, they're real, they're, they're nasty, and they're ugly. So. Well, see, that was very effective for the pal Taliban because psychologically, you you questioned the people your your friendlies over here, your blue team over there, because you didn't know if one of them was going to pick up and turn the gun on you. So that's a that to me, that's a very well thought out execution of a plan by was the awful. Taliban. I mean, because psychologically, you guys didn't trust your partners, and and you know, it, 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 so it, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I went there. back, to, you know, two other times after that, you know, and I, I stayed there for a few months afterwards, and. Um, you know, I would sit down and have chai every day, uh, with one of the majors, you know, uh, my counterpart, you know, we'd talk and, um, we had a great relationship and I didn't necessarily not trust him, but I didn't always trust the soldiers that were around him. Yeah. And so that chai time, you know, those hour or two that we'd sit down and talk, it was, you know, I, I made sure instead of going down by myself, I brought two other guys, you know, and they're fully loaded, you know, you know, ready to go if something happened. And so it breaks down that trust. And I, you know, I think the same thing can happen within an office space too. Yep. So um, let, let's talk maybe about training, right? Um, I, I've mentioned that quite a bit. You've mentioned it quite a bit. So um, getting those policies and procedures down, you know, you're sitting with your HR team, you're sitting with your legal team, you're sitting with your executive management, you're sitting down with your security team and you're coming up with these policies and procedures. And those are wonderful, right? That's a great first step. But how do you take those policies and procedures and push them to the next phase, which is training. Well, you, you're going to have to implement your, your, tra your training, right? You're going to have to build a training program or have somebody come in who knows what they're talking about and you're going to have to implement it. Uh, to me, I think this type of reaction, the, the policy and procedures and the, the awareness training for active shooters should be part of your initial onboarding. Like you would do with your sexual harassment training. You should have this in there too, how, how to respond, you know, like what's the company's policy? Is it run and hide? Is it, shelter in place is you know is it panic and you know i'm just joking you shouldn't panic but you know what i mean you you should have that in your training on your onboarding and then it should be part of your yearly training standard just like your sexual harassment your company policies you know everything that you train every year this should be part of it i i know in law enforcement we have x amount of hours that we have to do every year in order to maintain our certificate, you know, our in-service training is what we call it. I mean, you know, military has stuff similar. They're always training you with this stuff. You know, I, I wasn't in at the time and the whole sexual harassment came in. I know you guys trained on it. It was, is I think I did it once before I got out, but now you guys do it, what, two or three times a year or something like that? Or That's once a year, it? you know, similar once like your okay. yeah, anti-terrorism force protection, your sexual harassment, your equal opportunity. And I think a lot of corporations, like you're saying, have incorporated yeah. uh, that same policy of, hey, once a year. And honestly, with an active shooter in workplace violence, I, I recommend they do it twice a year. Yeah. Uh, you know, once a year you, you, and most, I'd be a total hypocrite, right? Uh, and, and be lying to all our listeners, and viewers out there, if I said, yeah, you know, I, you know, I took the training seriously when I was in, no, I, I clicked it yeah. as fast as I could. Um, yeah. And now as a security professional going out and getting companies to buy in on this, uh, I look back like, man, I was an idiot, you know? Uh, and I, I think I had a, an ego 
up there of like, Hey, mm-hmm. you know, I was a green beret, blah, blah, blah. I can handle my own. Um, until that world comes crashing down, um, and you can't handle your own. So, um, do the training and I, I recommend doing it twice a year, you know, um, well, it doesn't I, I have to be two days long. It could be, yeah. you know, an hour or two. Half long. an hour. Yep. And I think where most training falls short is they do the same training year after year after year. They don't update it. They don't change it. It's the same training year after year. So by year two, three, you're like, ah, I've done this before. I don't need to pay attention. Ah, I click the thing. I, I've heard all this for the last two years. Why am yeah, I doing absolutely. it? Absolutely. And so it's that's vanilla. where you, I call it good. vanilla training. Yes. Yep. So that's where it, it's important to have a good training officer or training personnel who's going to implement new training, updated training with you. And you also want to, you know, contact your local law enforcement, your security people, whatever, and have that communication. So they know what to expect. You know what to expect. And I, I you know, being law enforcement, I, w- I would love if the companies would invite us in to come walk around and see the layout. So I know, oh, okay, I, I would have never thought this room was here, but now I know it's here, that type of thing. You know, I, SWAT team, when you have time to prepare, you know, we're getting blueprints and all that stuff, but active shooter, you don't have time to prepare. You don't have time to prep yourself to know what that building's like. So it's it's always good to go in and walk around, talk to people, look, look at where you're going. And if your business will allow it, I definitely think there should be that, that bridge between the responding agency and the businesses or the corporations. I uh, should implement some trying to train in that. So absolutely, I mean, traveling around, you know, across the country again, ad- advising companies on this, you know, large, large companies is um, working with your local law enforcement and first responders, right? Because it's not just the, your police officers and your sheriff's deputies that are going to show up, uh, and your FBI agents that are going to show up there on scene. It's also your firefighters and your EMT showing up uh, that are going to treat the casualties and, and triage. And so, the more that they can get involved in your company and understand the blueprint and the layout, like you were saying, well, of, of that building, we're talking again, seconds, milliseconds save lives at, at this point. And so the more familiar are, they are with, with that location, the better off everyone is in the end. And hopefully lives are saved. And I, I think, you know, the purpose of this podcast is to, to hopefully save a life. You know, if, if this tragic event occurs, if we can save one life uh, from from being spared, uh, this is a win, uh, in, in my opinion, um, on this topic. So, you know, that site specific training, working with a, with your local law enforcement, um, I would say most law enforcement agencies are more than happy to, you know, it, it's just, it's coordinating them. Again, there's a legal aspect, there's a time, um, and then set up another thing I recommend is is look in the past, you know, look at your company, go through this FBI report that we keep mentioning. Um, look at how your your company relates to some of these other companies um, and tie in that training event to look similar to some of these past events. Um, so it is realistic. And with a realistic training event, a lot of things are going to be eye opening and surprising. I think you're going to hopefully if companies are are doing, you know, the policies and procedures and they're going through um the DHS's website for the free training or the FBI um, free uh, active shooter training um, and the companies doing their own training, you know, working with a, a security consultant or a security professional um, with the skill set in mind. When that training event does happen, you're going to see the good and you're also going to see some of the flaws and, and nothing's ever going to be perfect. Um, mm-hmm. But hopefully the more you train, the more prepared you are. Um, and I think things will come up in training that you can't predict, you know, people are unpredictable. And so somebody might react completely different than what you expect them to react, you know? And so you're never going to have a perfect plan. Absolutely. Um, you know, and plans are really just, um, so you can understand, I guess the, the larger picture. And then, uh, when stuff does happen in real life, you're going to have to adjust. So, um, again, I think we've mentioned, you know, go to DHS, they have a, uh, a free active shooter uh, training site. FEMA. FEMA has one as well. The FBI does as well. Um, use those. You know, if you are a small company or a company that doesn't have the resources currently now, push those websites out to your employees. Make sure that they go through them. You know, maybe do it over a luncheon or something. Um, but definitely get the training, have that plan in place. So, uh, that will, um, I think we've kind of covered you know, policies, procedures, and training. training um, yeah. And hopefully, you know, 
people can feel and understand our, our urgency and our uh, the importance of, uh, of the subject today. Uh, not nearly as um, comedic, uh, mainly because Will and I are kind of dry. We're not nearly as funny as Ray, but also <laughs> yeah. the subject is a is a is a quite serious subject. So, um, you know, let's uh, let's hope that no one ever has to uh, be involved in an active shooter. But if you are, uh, I hope that you know you take time to help with those policies and procedures and training and everyone makes it out alive. So, well, one thing I, I want to say, I, I know law enforcement does it and I know military does it. You know, you, you walk through your mind, how you can interact to different situations. And I think that's something that everybody can do. You know, you're sitting here typing away, doing your, your, you know, progress report or whatever, you know, you have top five minutes. Just think about, okay, if somebody comes in, how am I going to react? And, and I know that's helped me a lot in my career, thinking about how to, how to really react to a certain situation before it happens. So when that situation does occur, it, it just, you have that muscle memory, you know, it's not like muscle memory. So I, I know Absolutely. We did, I'm sure you did. Yeah. So no, I mean, we always talk about covering concealment in the military, right? So when you're patrolling along, where's your closest cover? Uh, where can you get concealment? Um, and the same thing can happen in work workspace. Hey, you say, you know, where's your fire, where's your closest exit yeah. um if you can't get to the exit where's the best place you can barricade yourself and protect yourself while this is going down who's going to call 911 do you, you know do you have a panic button inside the office um if not maybe that's something you need to think about you know where someone can hit it and it immediately notifies the authorities that hey something horrible is going on um you know so again that goes into the policies procedures but goes back into your of, of planning that mental planning on your own part of where am I going to go when something like this happens? What am I going to do? You know, and then hopefully how can I help, you know, my buddy to the left and right of me, you know, how can we get out of here uh, alive or escape with the least injury as possible? So um, you got anything else, Will, for, Nope. Just, uh, you know, if you want to follow us, subscribe, uh, coffee squad podcast.com, please subscribe, you know, download us, listen to us, let us know what, you would like to hear how we're doing, give us comments, feedback. Well, you know, we're all thick skinned except for Jake. He's got a little less skin, but you know, the rest of her all thick skinned and you know, just oh, it's an amputee joke. Huh? <laughs> you can also follow us on Facebook, uh, coffee squad podcast and you'll pop up. So uh, Jake. Awesome. Hey, uh, uh, enjoy, enjoy the conversation this week. Best of luck to the astronauts. Uh, take it off on Saturday. Um, I know some people are starting to follow the news with the riots on Thursday, uh, last night. So, um, if you're in a major city or in near metropolitan area where this is occurring or may be occurring, um, stay safe, stay vigilant. Um, and again, have a plan in mind. So, um, appreciate everyone listening this week and have a great weekend. All right. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye.